we didn't read those stories, did we? <laughs> We read from Beatitudes, from another famous moment in elevated geography, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's not a typical way to study the Transfiguration at all. The Beatitudes from Matthew are serving as our theme for the middle school conferences this summer, so I've committed on doing a deep dive this spring on the text. So thanks for coming along for the ride. If you're not familiar with our middle school conferences, it's four weeks of absolute magic. It's led in part by a team of high school students whom we call advocates, like the nickname of the Holy Spirit. Watching the advocates provide mentoring and guidance to the middle schoolers is just incredible. They lead games and energizers, but the advocates are also telling the story of our faith and of their faith. I'm a little embarrassed to admit it now, but I was initially kind of unimpressed with their chosen scripture of the Beatitudes. It felt like they were going straight for the greatest hits. I mean, this is really Jesus' greatest hits. He also preaches these themes in his Sermon on the Plain in Luke. Thankfully, I held my tongue and I listened to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the advocates on our planning team. The high school students were so drawn to the themes of blessedness. They were particularly intrigued by the ways we hear blessed in our culture and in our society, associated with wealth and materialism. The advocates wanted to focus instead and better understand how they are blessed and how they might be a blessing unto others. I'm already endlessly proud of this group of young leaders, and I'm glad I heard them out. What an important lesson for our world today. There's a reason the Beatitudes are Jesus' greatest hits. They're good. It is strong messaging. It's memorable. It's kind of catchy. And it has very important lessons for us today. Today, in the chaos and suffering of the world full of pandemic and war, and yes, also Transfiguration Sunday. The language of the Beatitudes can be a little confounding at first. Blessed be the poor and the mourning and the meek. Blessed be those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers. What does that blessed language even mean here? Yes, of course, those who are grieving are still blessed. But I don't understand how is that in the same breath as those seeking peace and justice in our world? What connects all of this in Jesus' sermon? Margaret Eimer's Bible study called Confessing the Beatitudes helped me make sense of this one. The Reverend Dr. Eimer is the academic dean for Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Texas and a New Testament scholar and professor. I highly recommend her work on the Beatitudes to you because we could spend months and find a million different things to say and to learn about this scripture. But she offers an alternative interpretation of the blessed language we find here. She uses greatly honored. Greatly honored are those who are mourning, those who are merciful and meek and making peace and seeking justice. When we hear the word blessed in this particular way, we understand something of the countercultural message of Jesus. In a society that tends to be embarrassed by big emotional displays like mourning, Jesus sees those in grief and lifts them up as the ones to be honored. When Jesus talks about the meek, he's talking about the oppressed and the exploited. He, when he talks about those who are persecuted, he doesn't mean those who are members of a dominant culture ignoring and erasing others. In a world full of war and violence and anger, Jesus offers blessing to those who are already actively seeking peace and righteousness. If you look back over today's gospel lesson, there's two groups of people Jesus is talking about. The ones who are struggling, and the ones who are offering help. Blessed and greatly honored are those in their suffering, in their oppression, and in their mourning. 
God is with them. And blessed and greatly honored are those trying to change this by offering mercy and working for peace. God is with them too. Not only does Jesus offer honor to the long-suffering, he also rebukes those who are oblivious to it. This is where it comes in handy that the Beatitudes are some of the greatest hits we have multiple sermons to draw from. When he offers similar blessings in Luke in the Sermon on the Plain, he scolds those who are already having their fill and their comfort. This is a promise from God that the wicked will not always prevail. That's not to say that it's wicked to have enough to eat. It's not wicked to have a safe place to call home. It's not wicked if you haven't experienced great loss. But it is wicked if these things are ostentatious or at the expense of others. Jesus was pretty clear about humility and not being consumed by materialism and getting ahead. In these blessings over the meek and the struggling and the belittled, Jesus teaches that this kind of extravagance in the face of suffering is not honorable. Jesus tells of a promise that the kingdom of God is for the destitute and lowly, not because of their destitution, but because God is with them in their suffering. They are not alone. But those who are self-absorbed with their own wealth and glory, those who are unaware of their neighbors who are struggling, they're going to miss out. The justice spoken about in the Beatitudes isn't even about judgment, but righting what is wrong and building a relationship with God and one another. This is about being present to and with our neighbors in their distress, because God is. God honors them and blesses them. It is hard to remember God's presence once we come down from the mountain. Whether that mountain is literal or figurative, when we come back down to the everyday suffering in the world, it's hard sometimes to notice or remember that God is with us. And it's even harder to show that presence to one another. But what a time to remember this lesson. What a time to remember to shirk the materialistic things we get so wrapped up in and just be together. It's so hard. We can't all even be together in person at the moment. But being present and attentive to the suffering and struggling of others is so important. The world is full of such difficulty. We can make sure that our neighbors near and far aren't alone in that. I am so grateful to my calling to camp and conference ministry, where I get to see people practice and learn how to be present to one another and to God's blessings. At places like Massanetta Springs and so many other camp and retreat centers, people of different ages and backgrounds, people from all kinds of places come together just to be just to step away from the everyday and be. To be together, to be open, to be present to the incredible work of the Holy Spirit guiding us to follow Christ's teachings. And it's not just the summer youth programs, although those are really special. It's conferences for people of all ages. It's retreats, offering rest from the overwhelming every day. It's offering welcome and renewal and hospitality. It's a time to go up on the mountain and remember what it feels like to be so close to God, to be in God's presence in such pronounced ways. It's a time and a place to practice being present to one another, like God has been present with us. And even for folks who aren't called to serve in that particular kind of ministry, it's being connected and partnering in that work from afar. Around the same time I got to Massanetta Springs this fall, so did a few other people from Afghanistan. 
When Church World Service asked Massanutta Springs to help with refugee resettlement following the most recent crisis in Afghanistan, the staff and the board said, yes, of course. Yes, we will care for these neighbors. Yes, we will welcome the stranger. Yes, we see the difficulty that has brought them to our doorstep and we will find a way to bring them in. And together, Christiansburg, we found that way. We've hosted over 180 people so far, including two of the very newest little neighbors who were born right there in Harrisonburg. We've served three meals a day and housed individuals and families as Church World Service has gotten them set up with language learning and job placement and permanent housing. In a time when the whole world feels like a disaster, you joined us in moving quickly to support these new neighbors in their time of great personal need. This is actually what brings me here today. It's great to be with you. I'll visit any time. I'm not just here to brag about the thoughtfulness of a group of teenage leaders who I'm so honored to serve alongside and chose today's scripture. I'm here to say thank you. There are so many ways this ministry connects us to one another and so many other people from around the world that we might really see and be present to one another. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank God for you, for your partnership in this particular work at Massanetta. Thank you for the financial gifts that you made that made this work possible. Thank you for your support and your connection and your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is a hard time to find the energy to be present to the suffering of others. It has been a particularly difficult string of years for our society, so full of loss and grief. The depths of despair often feel like the complete opposite of a mountaintop experience. But just because we feel God best at the top of a mountain doesn't mean God isn't with us down here too. We are called to continue to shine brightly and reflect God's love and presence in our world, even when we depart from those incredible places and moments of closeness with God. This is not an easy calling. War creeps closer to Ukraine's capital in Kyiv. The plague of coronavirus may have slowed, but it is not over, and our healthcare workers are suffering greatly as they strain to care for us. Storms rage on around the world with massive wildfires and tornadoes and flooding in our own country in recent months. It is exhausting and deeply distressing to be present to all of this. But God is. God is with us during the special mountaintop moments, and God is with us in the midst of our suffering. Jesus teaches this in the Beatitudes as he reminds us that it is honorable and blessed to be providing this presence for others. In a moment, we'll pause to reflect on this message, and then we'll break our silence with hymn number 338, Kumbaya. It's a pretty stereotypical campfire song, isn't it? This old spiritual first came from the Gullah people of coastal South Carolina and Georgia. The words kumbaya have a complicated linguistic story, but are generally accepted to mean, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Someone's crying, Lord, come by here. Come be present with them in their grief. Someone needs you, Lord, come by here. This song was popular at scout camps and church camps through the folk music era. It was sung in civil rights movements and made popular by singers like Pete Seeger and Joan Baez who called for peace in our world. This is a message not dissimilar to the lessons of the Beatitudes, which call for us to come by here and be present to the suffering in our midst, to right the wrongs, to bring comfort to the afflicted. 
While mountaintop places are perfect for practicing these lessons, we must remember that we are called to this work every day of our lives as Christians. This is what Jesus calls us to, to lift up those who are poor, to fill up those who are empty, to comfort those who mourn. May we honor God by honoring those all around us in their suffering. May we remember God is present with us as we are present with one another. May we find those mountaintop moments to rest and feel close to God. And then let's come down from our mountaintops and continue the work of Christ in this world. Amen.
our prayers for Kathy Hollingsworth and her family as they grieve. We pray for Wanda Simonis, for Tom Teach and his family and their grief, for Gary Fussell. We pray for Margaret Thompson and her family as they grieve, for Phil Daniels and his family and their grief. We continue to pray for Bob and Bonnie Fisher, for Pam King. We pray for the family of Herb Elkins in their grief, for Jenny Poff and her family as they grieve. And we pray for Claudia Stutzman, for Robert Mayorga, for Patty Walker Jordan. We pray for Fran Hart, for Harriet Stockhoff, and for Dick Horn. Lord, in your kindness, hear our prayer. You do hear us, O oh God. You are always there to listen. So we thank you. And now we pray as you taught us in Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now let us worship God through the giving of our gifts. Let us pray. In deep gratitude for all that you have given us, we offer ourselves and our gifts to you, O God. Let us be living sacrifices of worship and praise. Transform our hearts and minds from the inside out. Show us what is good and pleasing in your sight, so we may be quick to recognize your call and quick to respond. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.
keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.